R&D India, solving a variety of mobility-related problems. He and his team are at the forefront of the mobility revolution that is expected to transform the way we move or get things in the next five years. Prior to this, he was also one of the key people responsible for building LinkedIn's global mobile platform. At LinkedIn, a product data science team where he was responsible for defining the strategy and execution and helped build great data-driven products for the next billion professionals. Prior to LinkedIn, he co-founded a music content sharing platform and advised many startups at Pavan Kumar, the topic for today is importance of analytics in digital business. Mr. Kumar, welcome and the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Minakshi, and uh, super excited to be a part of this panel. Um, good evening, good morning. Uh, I think it's also a global audience. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. I'm going to be talking about a few things that are uh, very important. I think most of the pe most of the courses or you know some of the content that you guys keep exploring may not talk about this. Let's get to the to the business end of the conversation in terms of you know what is data science, right? What are different things that happen? I think largely uh, there's been a couple of uh, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Getting a lag. All right. So let me share my screen. Let's start with you there. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, so I think one of the one of the uh, topics for today is is to kind of like talk reality, right? Uh, try to give you guys a sense of you know what data science is all about, uh, right? Data science is also such a vast uh, field. There are you know there's generally when you are thinking about data science in general, you know there, there are you know titles that pop up, right? So there are you know business analytics, there is data science, there is you know, data analysts, there are, you know, product analysts, there are machine learning engineers, you know, there is artificial intelligence engineer, right? How does all of that kind of merge? Where does this convene, right? What are some of the typical functions of, of, of these titles, right? How do they differ from each other? How do you make the right choice for yourself, right? What is really important is something that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, you know, just a little bit of like, you know, those are really kind words. Uh, currently, I'm actually heading data science and analytics at Uber, Uber India. Uh, prior to this, I was actually heading Uber product data science for LinkedIn. With that, let's uh, let's dive into you know what what do you need right to be to become a data scientist? What are some of the core competencies that we actually look for in a candidate when you're interviewing for you know, companies like LinkedIn, companies like Uber, Amazon? You know some of the big companies that are out there, right? So what are some of the fundamental things that you go? Fundamental skills uh, that we actually index heavily on, right? One is you need business acumen, right? I'm going to talk about what business acumen is, right? So then you also need coding, right? So why is coding becoming very, very important? I talk about that, right? Uh, communication, problem solving, stakeholder management, statistics and modeling and deep work. Now, why is it that you really need business acumen and what does business acumen actually mean? Business acumen is, is nothing but having a very good understanding of the business domain. Like for example, uh, there are different types of problems that a data scientist will solve, right? Let's take my example, uh, my case as an example, right? So when I was a data scientist with LinkedIn, the type of problems that I solved was mostly related to social network, right? How people connect, how people talk, how people converse, uh, how people engage with each other, you know, spam, is it useful, you know, how much time people are spending on the, on the platform, is the feed relevant for them, is the content relevant for them, and so on and so forth. Right now, when when I've actually made the move to Uber, the the domain itself is very different, right? So here we are actually talking about problems that as like you know how do I match a rider with a with a driver? How does my matching algorithm work, right? What is the ETA, right? So am I basically if I'm if I'm telling you I'm going to pick pick up a ride pick up a rider in five minutes, am I actually picking them up? Why? What is the travel time model going to look like? Uh, you know. Are we providing the right experience? Safety, safety becomes such a big, big aspect with mobility, right? How are you creating routes? Shorter distance algorithm, right? Um, like, let's say for example, at Uber, we are actually building this 
any product called the bus right the bus has a different problem altogether right so how do you design routes how many stops should a bus have how many schedules should you have right should you should you have bus operating at every 15 minute interval should the bus operate at like you know half an hour interval and so on and so forth you know how many schedules do you need like morning how many schedules in the evening can you have a fixed route can you have a dynamic route right so there are things uh, there are things like that uh, that becomes really really important so domain knowledge becomes very very critical in terms of you know solving problems right without having that good understanding of the domain knowledge for example at linkedin we do uh, a, a bunch of problems which are you know network related like for example if you take facebook right one of the things that they do if you're onboarding on facebook you know they don't even let you do anything till you add seven friends right because the magic really happens when you connect with your friends right uh, but at uber you know our intent is very clearly established right people are coming because they want to travel they want to take a ride right the use case becomes very important and the problems and the solutions that you design are centered around them so business acumen becomes a very very deep strength uh, that that a lot of people actually look for so when you're interviewing for some of these companies i think at least from statistical point of view one of the things that uh, we've noticed is people lack business acumen right because if you if you take up an interview with facebook facebook is going to give you a facebook related problem right uh, if I, if you take up a interview with uber uber is going to give you a uber related problem right so how do you like if you don't have a deep understanding of that right so you're not going to be able to crack that code right for example what is what is important for linkedin uh, you know for linkedin one of the metrics that could be important is you know number of sessions right how often are people coming back right how much time are people spending on the application right uh, for facebook and some of this you know networking platform you know uh, solutions around you know helping people spend a lot more time on the application becomes useful right but when you look at uber we don't want them to spend a lot of time right one of the metrics that we track is how quickly can i give you a ride right we want you to be on the app as as little as possible right we want you to be on the ride as much as possible right so imagine like the solutions that you are going to deploy are very very different so this is how the, the differentiation actually comes in with business acumen now coding why is coding becoming you know more and more relevant right uh, if you if you look at you know 5 years back or 10 years back the amount of data that that companies collected or the amount of uh, data availability that we had was very limited right today the amount of data that we collect is gigantic right so you know some of those big companies actually go on to collect petabytes worth of data in a day right we are we're looking at at least a billion rows of data right on a daily basis now if you basically have to query them write algorithms on top of it make meaningful sense out of that data you need to write efficient codes right you need to learn efficient coding technologies like you know you you start with sql then you kind of get into r then you move to python then you do pyspark Uh, then you do Scala and so on and so forth, right? So coding becomes very, very important because otherwise, uh, you know, your your infrastructure is not going to scale, right? So uh, some of the top tech companies will also have this rule as to like if your code doesn't run in five minutes, you know, the code gets scaled, right? There's there's a very high appetite for like code efficiency, right? Coding becomes very, very important. And in some of the interviews, uh, you know, it's not just enough to get the coding right. you know they also measure how soon did you get the work right so depending on levels like for example i give you this right so uh, at at uber uh, or at linkedin or some other tech companies right so this is a this is practiced widely right so if you are applying for let's say a freshman data scientist right for that question there is also a time limit right you could have eventually solved that problem but if you solved it in under 10 minutes you're basically leveled at one position if you solved it in 5 minutes you're leveled at a higher position and so on and so forth right so time becomes time is also another component that plays out in coding communication right as data people uh, what is really important is you know how do we communicate right we actually learn a lot of black box models uh, we write a lot of like mathematical models right how do you explain it to business right how do you explain this as as if you are explaining this to a 5 year old kid because very very important right you have a very structured communication right so it's it's one of the core competencies right because uh, data doesn't necessarily answer all the questions accurately right we are inferring a lot of things right we don't have an, we don't have a perfect answer right so when you're when you when you're actually you know looking into the data to find a answer or find a solution uh, most often or not uh, the data is not going to give you an accurate answer the data is basically is presented in front of you and you are inferring it right 
how do you accurately position that inference, right? Sometimes uh, I'll give you this example, right? Why is this going to become important? Right? Let's take this problem. Let's take this use case. Uh, let's say there are two schools, right? One school is given an iPad, and the other school is not given an iPad, right? And you measure, you know, how are kids or students performing with school that has an iPad versus the school that didn't give us an iPad, right? And you see that the academic performance or the grades of the students with iPads were actually higher. Versus the uh, students without an iPad, right? Now, if you just look at that data, right, the data is basically going to tell you that hey, you know, iPads are the magic, right? If you give more iPads, people become smarter, right? Now, this is what the data is going to tell you, right? Data is not going to tell you the accurate answer, right? Now, the only information that you had is, you know, there were two schools, and the only variable difference between you know each of those schools where one school gave iPad and the other didn't, right? Now at this point, if you basically make a wrong inference and say that you know iPad was a differentiator, right? Then this is a wrong insight, right? In fact, it could just be that it's it has nothing to do with the iPad, right? The teachers in that school were also better, right? But you didn't have that data, right? Nobody told you that you know what was the quality of teaching, right? Maybe the the kids that got enrolled in that school were you know generally more smarter, right? You didn't know that. Right? Maybe the facility in the school. This was just iPad, but they also had other things apart from iPad. Right? There was a strong computer science curriculum. Right? There could be so many other variables that influence the outcome. Sometimes we just don't have access to that data, or we don't have you know visibility into those variables or factors. Right? So when you're making that inference, uh, right, it's really important for you to communicate effectively. Like for example, in this iPad case, what would I communicate? Right? My communication would, would be that hey, you know. With the resources that I have, or with the data that I'm basically seeing, seems like iPad is one of the key variables, right? Basis, you know, the data that I have, but there could be other things, right? We need more data to kind of, right? How do you position that insight becomes very, very important because uh, you guys are going to actually, you know, be involved, are going to be involved in a lot of decision making, right? As data scientists like at Uber. Um, you know, without a data scientist signing off on a feature or an experiment or or an insight, you know, you don't see a feature rolled out into you know the core app, right? If you're seeing a new icon, if you're seeing a new button, if you're seeing anything new on the application without a data scientist approving it, it doesn't go live, right? That's the power that you hold, right? And with that power, if you don't necessarily do the right thing, right, you you could basically influence the business to go downwards. Right, you could make wrong inferences. So communication becomes really, really important. Right, uh, relaying that insight very clearly becomes very important. Right, so communication is going to be one of the strengths. Right, so you will have questions which are, uh, which which may have different inferences, uh, and you know people look for like you know how are you kind of you know dissecting that information and presenting the most accurate picture. Problem solving. Right, problem solving becomes the most. End of the day, our data scientists are are all problem solvers. Right? Why are we the better problem solvers out there? Right? We have a good mix of business, a good mix of tech, and we have a good mix of math. Right? Um, if you if you only knew business, you're a great businessman. Right? You're a great business guy. Right? If you only knew tech, you become you end up becoming a great engineer. Uh, if you only knew math, you end up becoming a statistician. But if you know all three together, you become a great data scientist, right? That's why we are actually sitting in a very, very powerful seat, right? We kind of like close the loop there, right? And problem solving becomes very, very important, right? How do you solve the problem? I give you a few examples between like, you know, having to understand the business acumen and then apply those things to kind of solve the right problem for the company. Stakeholder management becomes another key area that really, really is important because like, you know, you don't work alone, right? Like most of the individual functions, uh, your title, your role doesn't allow you to kind of just work alone independently. You need to be constantly interacting with a product manager, with an engineer, with designers, with marketing people, with the business stakeholders, right? You're constantly interacting. You're constantly seeking more clarity to the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Sometimes, you know, the, the questions that come across to you is not necessarily the right question to solve or the right problem to solve, right? So seeking clarity, you're relaying insights, you're saying that, hey, I need to collect more data, you're working with an engineer and saying that I need better instrumentation, right? So stakeholder management becomes a very important thing. And then statistics, right? Where do you use statistics, right? You use analytics, you use analytics to actually inspire 
right? To ask a lot of questions, inspire actions from data. And then you use statistics to actually validate if some of the actions that you or some of the inspirations that you have from the data can be like statistically applied correctly, right? Uh, so statistics become really important. And then modeling, of course, like you guys must have learning a lot of machine learning, a lot of deep learning concepts that are coming up. Modeling, modeling becomes very, very important. And when you're talking about modeling, right? So there's breadth and depth, both, right? If you're if you're taking an analytics field, right, breadth becomes a lot more important, right? If you're if you're if you're taking up data science or AI, depth becomes more and more important, right? And even with modeling, there are there are a few constructs that I'm going to talk about in the next slides. You know that that's it's basically going to like uncover, you know, a variety of things when when it comes to modeling. What are some of the things that we look at? Right? And then there's there's of course teamwork, right? With with um, because we're we're that function, you know, we're kind of that hub that connects. To a lot of different functions without teamwork i don't think you can actually you know succeed in this job right if you if you if you ever ask anybody right what are some of the core competencies for a data scientist right these seven things are going to be become like uh, the preamble in some sense right so, so just make a note of this these are all the things that are really really important if you really want to become a data scientist right and what differentiates a, a data scientist from a really good data scientist is a data scientist knows how to use how to write models the data scientist knows how to how to you know use sql python uh, crunch data crunch number uh, write a linear machine learning model use some amount of statistics right so you know you could be a data scientist but if you really want to stand out uh, right while you're doing that you need to be doing all of the other things too right cool so uh, let's talk about skills what are some of the core skills that you Right, so I'm going to break up skills into two two types of skills. Right, one is foundational skills, and the other is core skills. Right, what are foundational skills? Foundational skills are some of the common skills that every data scientist is expected to have. Right, regardless of you know what job you do. Right, uh, instead of this huge data science family, there are many jobs that I'm going to talk about. What foundational skills are nothing but just common skills that everybody needs to have. Right, so these are very common across the board. Right, and there are you know core skills that are defined specifically for each of your tracks. Right. We're going to talk about that, right? A track may need knowledge of core skills and other tracks, right? Uh, where you basically bring in proficiency, right? Um, let's talk about you know what are some of the foundational skills, right? The foundational skills become like you know data manipulation, right? Uh, as basic as you know, do you can you basically manipulate data? Can you filter in the data? Can you write SQL queries? Can you use Python to kind of you know do a, you know first level of exploratory data analysis, right? Cut the data, write efficient code, and so on and so forth, right? That becomes your foundational skills. Then foundational scientific skills, right? Becomes your mathematical ability, your economics, statistics, right? Do you understand what deviation is, what variance is, what covariates are, uh, and some of those things, and then of com computation, right? Uh, if you take the modern age technologies, the modern age companies, a lot of questions are around computation. All right? If you if you were to write a query like this versus a query, if, if there are you know if you're trying to solve one problem, you could write queries in two different ways. Right? So one you write a query where you use a join, and the other where you actually use a filter or a subquery. All right? They're going to actually ask you what is the computation difference between both of them. Right? Which one is lighter on the system? Right, you should have a good understanding of what computation means, right? From that uh, perspective, and then a good domain knowledge, right? Or what is marketing? Uh, you know, if you're actually taking up a product specific role, you know, what is that product doing? What is the vision of that product? If you're taking a marketing thing, then you know the type of problems that you will solve is very specific. If you're taking economics related jobs, right, uh, financial related jobs, then you you have some amount of that domain knowledge, right? And then soft skills is common, I think. Uh, one of the core uh, skill sets that we actually look for is like communication, right? And soft skill basically enables that, right? Written and verbal, verbal and written, both are really, really important because you're the you're the person who's basically going to do a lot of analysis and tell, here is how we are supposed to solve this problem, right? And sometimes you have to write documents, uh, right? That basically says, this was a problem and this is a solution. How did we get here, right? When you, when you build a model, you know, what has gone into the model, how do you interpret the model, and so on and so forth, right? Soft skill becomes very, very important. Now let's let's talk about core skills, right? Now core skills, like I told you, is actually broken down different uh, depending on tracks, right? So now what are these tracks? Now this, this is this is a common question that I keep getting, right? A lot of people reach out to me on LinkedIn, 
uh, and say you know hey you know um, I, I i want to pick up data scientist but i don't know which kind of field to specialize in right should i take bi or uh, business intelligence should i take data analytics is there product analytics and people don't even know what is the difference between all of them okay i want to basically break this down and give you give you some clarity in terms of you know what is the industry uh, industry wide divide right in terms of you know some of these functions which which today actually sits under this big umbrella of data science or analytics right uh, but internally uh, across across all of the big companies you know we've divided this into three big buckets right and then broken that down into like several buckets there on right one is the first track is insight and strategy right now insight and strategy will have a lot of like analysts right uh, where you will be performing a lot of exploratory data analysis data storytelling narration data visualization very very powerful right for in this role you're going to be connected much closer to a business right you're going to be working with a product manager you're going to be working very closely with general managers business owners of the company and so on and so forth right here it requires a particular trait right which is you have the ability to kind of you know uh, think strategically all right uh, connect with user problems all right for example uh, you know l- let me give you an example all right uh, let's take uber all right uh, uber has an onboarding flow right so you you install the app and then you give your phone number then you get an otp then then you add your uh, whatever you create your password then you add your payments profile and so on and so forth now here you're saying you know what should the flow look like right how do you optimize the flow Like what is working, what is not working, right? Suddenly, if uh, if let's say my signups went down, is that because my OTP got delayed, right? An OTP should reach you by thirty seconds at max. On an average, historically, it was reaching in like ten seconds, and now that's inflated to forty seconds, right? Because it's forty seconds, a few users are dropping off, right? So that's why your conversion is bad, right? What is a good pickup time for Uber? Like for example, when I'm when I'm writing this match in the Twitter. Right when I'm so imagine there are hundreds of millions of users who are actually requesting a ride on Uber at the same point in time. Right? Imagine uh, I think Swiggy wrote a post. I don't know if you guys follow. Uh, Swiggy just wrote a post. They have hundred k users at any point in time ordering food on their app. Right? Now there are hundred k users and they have to match that hundred k users to hundred k delivery executives. Right? And this hundred k users are actually ordering from hundred. different restaurants uh, right how do you match the closest you know delivery executive in, in a way that the food reaches faster in a way it is efficient right how do you do that what is the like if, if you take the same example and put it into into um, you know uber uh, we have this concept called as pick up time right how do you match in such a way that the driver comes and picks you up then the fastest right now if you're requesting a ride and if i basically you know match you with with a driver who's like you know 5 km away it's inefficient right it's inefficient with time it's inefficient with cost because the driver has to you know drive for like 5 km it's it's not the right experience right how do you design that right what is a good time right now i could match it in 1 km i could match it with 2 km i could match it in 3 km less than 0.5 km where do you where do you draw that cut off right this is these are the guys who actually you know understand user behavior a lot they they kind of like you know take uh, this data and say like hey with different pickup times how does my conversion vary right how does my cancellation vary right they look at that and say that at, at a certain threshold right beyond a certain threshold it doesn't make sense because we are seeing the cancellation or conversion dropping drastically or exponentially right so we keep, so this become my card rate right for example i'm just going to throw a hypothetical example right so um you know it's a uber drive so optimize this for like less than 5 minutes right 5 minutes is the cut off anything beyond 5 minutes is not a good thing, right so those are the things that 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 an insights guy is actually doing right so this requires very very deep domain knowledge uh, and also requires you know strong verbal and written communication right Um, and imagine you need to have a very passionate data storytelling skill set. Now let's talk about you know inference and algorithms, right? Inference and algorithms uh, are slightly more technical, right? Slightly more engineering 
experiment right here you do a lot of experimentation you do causal inference right and the causal inference you know what is causal inference right so we spoke about this example of you know giving kids an ipad like a school is giving an ipad and the other the school is not giving an ipad right now one of the inferences that you can make is you just look at data and pick up an insight at face value you would say that give ipads to all the kids and kids are going to become smarter right yes there is a correlation right but it's not causation right and if you actually acted on that insight and gave gave ipads to the other school and your expectation is these guys should have become smarter right but you know six months down the line you realize no their grades have changed right what does that tell you right the ipads was didn't have a causal effect right on the outcome now how do you figure out causal effect right you figure out causal effect is the causal effect the simple definition of causal effect is you for sure know if you dig into this the outcome is going to be right now how do you find causation in in uh, in all of this right is is something that we that that an inference or an algorithm team is actually going to be working right causal inference is becoming such a big thing these days um, there's you know higher higher demand for causal inference because um, you know the bottom line is the 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 faster you seek the truth the better the business becomes right and how do you seek the truth is establishing causation between you know your input variable and your output variable, right so causal causal inference becomes another thing really that's really really important applied machine learning and modeling now i could just start with like machine learning then you know applied and modeling and so on and so forth right so machine learning sits under inference and algorithms now um, there are actually two types two two things that are actually happening one is most companies are also moving away from black box models right now what is a black box model a black box black box model is something where you basically write a model or leverage a library to build a model where you don't understand what the model is doing right you're moving away because you really don't know what's happening right most companies want models to be interpretable where right? they want to know what is going in and what is coming out right how are both of them right there's a lot of emphasis on that and that that's part one right so there's a lot of like you know white label models that uh, that are coming back into the demand right if you look at most of these uh, companies we don't start by applying neural networks for a problem right we start by just applying logistic regression right so that you make sense of the data you start with logistic regression you start you take your first step right then you understand then you kind of move right to different things then you move to a tree then you move to you know deep learning then you move to networks and so on and so forth right uh, so there's a lot of emphasis on interpretability in this data, right so always keep that in mind sometimes in the interview people are going to like question you on this right why did you choose a very very deep tech model versus why did you just start with a logistic regression Right, what's wrong with it? Right, I have a very good understanding of it. Very, very important. Right, uh, there's of course always trade-offs. Right, model is not not like a zero or one solution. Right, there are always trade-offs when you build a model. Right, clearly understanding what is the trade-off becomes very, very important. Like for example, when I'm building a risk-based model, like for example, if I want to find fraud on Uber, right, uh, there are algorithms or models that I build. Now, I don't want to build a black box model on fraud. right because if if i were to penalize a good user as a bad user as false positives right it's a really bad experience right so different thresholds are applied for different type of modelings uh, different type of use case different type of sensitivity right depends on you know if, if you're actually building a model on a healthcare system right your sensitivity is really high right if you're building a propensity model to just target users to buy a product right the sensitivity is lower right even if you go for wrong it's okay right it doesn't you know necessarily hurt the business it doesn't necessarily hurt the user right uh, imagine if if we at linkedin did a wrong model um, of prioritizing a wrong set of users right it, it could cost them a job right so it becomes important to understand sensitivity right how do you cut how do you derive the right thresholds right now let's let's come to the second part of you know machine learning models now the second part is um, biases the data has a lot of bias the way that we collect the data is, is just based on human life right if you if you just look back look at our historical data and look at just world around us right uh, if you look at the history right uh, 
you know there is a lot of bias in the system right uh, let's take a very very simple example right so if you if you just look at employment there were more men in the employment than women right your model invariably is going to like you know look at that if you had a gender field as one of the feature variables right your model is going to basically look at you know uh, prioritize more men all right uh, just because of um, you know how our data structure like for example uh, if if you look at historical data about like crime in the us uh, your data sets that you get access to would actually flag more african americans right and you apply apply that same model using that historical data today uh you will have a lot of false positives right you would always like you know if if a african american did you know skip the signal or like whatever he didn't even do anything your model could you know predict that you know he's he's at fault right just because of the biases that exist in our data right how do you how do you clean that up right take linkedin for example if because the, there is this bias in this data if you always rank when when a recruiter is searching uh, for a profile if you always rank if it didn't clean up right if you did attribute the right ways you would always see more men than women for a particular job in the ranking algorithm right how do we create a, a, a balanced you know recommendation right becomes very very important right uh, so understanding bias in data is very important the third part is understanding memorization right sometimes you build models and the model is just memorizing right uh, you you don't want to stop at memorization you want the model to be able to predict things accurately right? you want the model to learn and to be able to test it on unseen data right becomes more and more important right so you know these are some of the fundamental things that you really need to kind of keep to uh, look out for right so these are these are really hard questions that people will post in front of you right how do you solve for them right? it is very tricky right having a good answer for some of these things is is very very useful and then privacy privacy is become such a such a big construct in this right what do you do with data 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 gives you a lot of power lot of power to influence manipulate uh, work in their favor you know go against them you must have all heard about the facebook fiasco with uh, with uh, the recent elections right not recent elections but like uh, the past elections that that's how much power data has right uh, are you using it for the right reason? become the bottom right as data scientists who are given this, this access you are given millions of people's data in front of you right are you actually using that to build ethical systems right it's in our hands right as as good data scientists it becomes you know very innate that you become that you're being very ethical about it, right you are not using any personal information right um, you could basically ask uh, uh, at uber we don't collect your age we don't collect your salary we don't collect you know what do you like what do you don't like nothing we don't even have any information apart from your phone number and we don't even give access to data scientist on any personal information the only thing that i know about you is there is a user who took a trip from this place to this place that's it right can you build models to see that right don't abuse the data that people are giving you right be very ethical when you're using data right uh, and this becomes very very important right the third is engineering solutions right and you must have also heard uh, you know people with like data engineering big data engineering uh, right uh, you know data product engineering right so this is a you know different functional group which is more engineering here you're actually writing you know etl codes right you're you're, you're basically sitting down and you know building data systems you're writing data architectures right uh, you're the you're the person who's actually saying that hey you know uh, the application is running on the platform people are you know coming out of the site they're engaging let's take facebook you know people are connecting uh, people are making friends people are you know liking this content they are sharing this content and so on and so forth you know how does that data flow in, right it's actually a stream level data you take that stream you do uh, you extract them you transform them and you load it back into some columnar or something right in a way that it makes sense for the business right sometimes you basically want this data to be represented as a graph node sometimes you want it as a distribution uh, distributed file system right sometimes you just want like a sql you know sql dom uh, sometimes you want a no sql architecture and so on and so forth right data engineers actually enable that 
right so data scientist can then query this data right so data scientists or analysts could then query this data right so these are these are the guys who actually build pipelines let's say once once you build a machine learning uh, models right how does the machine learning model actually sit into your production system right what are the pipelines that you need to be doing? what is the feedback loop that needs to come in right it's generally called as ml ops these days but you know this is also another function that becomes very important right so if you look at it you know for each of the tracks you need core skills and foundational skills foundational skills are something common that you really require across the board and for core skills you know uh these are you know useful things for you to pick up right so insight and strategy as a big umbrella has you know analysts data analysts product analysts uh, business intelligence right and several other things right business intelligence um is 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 largely focused on data journalism right is helping uh, companies make reports make dashboards visualize the content and and, and share a story out of it. right so very powerful thing right a data analyst is actually working and cleaning up data you know presenting good really good data good insights right um, you are taking a business problem and figuring out doing a lot of exploratory data analysis coming back with recommendation right and so on and so forth so let's uh, you know now that i spoke about you know what this means let's let's like let's spend some time on like just examples right now as insights and strategy right so i think we we touched about this uh, let's just go through this right so you know you write compelling narratives actionable insights uh, you're largely doing descriptive and predictive analysis right you're guiding product marketing or sales teams with data right largely uh, you discover new opportunities new problems in the product uh, right you're building new solutions you're mostly customer centric right you're driving business you're driving growth or you're driving customer success uh you're conceptualizing and building new metrics right now this is something that i can talk about right so let's talk about what is this metrics right uh as as uh, you know your analysts or you know as part of this insights and strategy one of the core skills skill sets that we also possess is uh, what is the true success metric that you should track right the underlying principle is if you don't track you can't measure if you can't measure you can't define all right if you don't measure you don't know what's broken or how badly is it broken right so what do you measure right what's really important what is the that one metric that the company should move on right if you if you ask this question at a very very high level right what is really that company's focus right everybody will say right um so let's take this as a question right so if you if you asked swiggy right uh what should be swiggy's you know true north or success metric everybody would say money orders revenue right how much of money should be made yeah so it's absolutely right money is important right the number of orders is important right but a, but a true business doesn't actually work that way right you have multiple teams responsible for multiple things right let's say a, a, a company like let's take uber in this case right uber has a team for growth right which is centered around you know acquiring customers acquiring riders right activating them uh, engaging them and retaining them right so that's the core responsibility of the team then there is the pricing team right what is the pricing team responsible for is to figure out the right prices how does price vary with demand and supply right so they have a different metric to monitor right and then there is this team about like you know churn or win back right where they're resurrecting you know users who who have lost all right uh, like at facebook you will also have like search team right people who are just responsible for search right uh, you will have video team right uh, people who are responsible for just you know that the video content that is there right so each of this team it becomes important that they are tracking a good success metric so that they can show that they are growing right for a for a growth team or whatever what what is that metric that is important is that you know imagine it's not enough for you to just get a user to sign up right uber doesn't make money with it right Uber is actually valuable, or Uber makes money, or engages a rider only when this user takes a ride with them. Right? So your success metric should be, you know, defined around that ride, right? Around that trip that a user takes, right? How do you define that in a way that it's very comprehensive, right? And it's actionable, and it's actually causes causal in nature, right? If a user actually took a trip, right, it's great, right? If what happens if we don't define this, right? Let's let's take this hypothetical example. um if you if you ended up defining a metric uh, for uber let's say number of signups 
for growth it's pretty easy right i will go to you know some period to year three cities i will burn half the money that i'm burning i will do marketing i will just acquire people uh, everybody is going to sign up they give me the number they take what if they sign up but they're not going to take a trip what use was this sign up right so creating that right metric becomes a problem that's a job of you know a, a good analyst right so right and then you you're also the part of the dashboards democratizing you know data driven decision making right they are going to come back to you they are going to constantly keep asking you should we do this should we not do this what is the data what is the decision that we should make right to solve this problem right for example one of the problems that we're trying to solve is uh, you know what is the pricing that we should keep for such right uh, how do you decide that right what is a good pickup time how do you decide that right so these are some of the things that you have to set up yourself right um develop external facing you know narratives right uh, we're also going to be you know creating a lot of blogs a lot of content uh, that people like you and me you know get the gym or check right influence other algorithms let's look at examples and responsibilities right um you know you like like a tool right causal analysis develop a lot of causal methods Right, we don't stop at correlation. Correlation is not leveraged these days as much. Correlation is good, doesn't get you beyond a line. Right, causal studies are becoming more and more important. Right, how do you optimize a funnel? How do you optimize? A lot of optimization is actually part of inference and algorithms. Right, um, like for example, technically very very deep. Uh, technical advancement in data science right you are you're responsible for writing algorithms you're responsible for writing models you're responsible for writing you know deep experimentations like you must have heard about experimentation as ab test uh, but there are four other types of ab test uh, did you know that like you could do a traditional ab test you could do synthetic control you could do switchbacks right so the variety of ab test right so where do you apply what right how do you do that right uh, and a lot of statistical kind of computation that becomes really important And then uh, let's talk about engineering solutions, right? Examples, right? Design and build sets of products, right? So, like I told you, right? So, uh, one is uh, you create uh, these functions actually end up creating the data layer, and some com- companies would actually have their internal. Like for example, there are companies which will connect a Power BI to this this data, right? It will connect a Tableau to this data, right? Or some companies actually build their own Tableau, right? Internally, right? Uh, they have their capabilities. At Uber, we have we have our own dashboards, a dashboard built by our own data engineers, right? Uh, becomes very very powerful, right? Uh, they build like visualization tools, right? For example, if you take uh, uh, if you take a traditional visualization tool, it might not be enough to visualize you know Uber like data, right? Where our data is like geospatial, right? Everything is on a map. A lot of things are on the map, right? How do you kind of visualize that map data? Like, how do you visualize like how people are moving, right? At any given point in time, to make sense, right? So there requires different kind of visualizations that you need to do, right? Um, entire de- development of data applications, like we spoke about, right? So this becomes like really, really important. So uh, with that, I'm um, gonna just pause. Uh, you know, largely we are we are actually talking about three different tracks. Uh, just to summarize, I'll just leave it on the slide. Um, you know, these are some of the core skill sets and some of the examples of like you know what what data science is all about and you know what you know, how how an industry looks at data science, how how an industry looks at you know splitting data science into different functions. So we uh, pause for Q and A. We have received five questions so far. Shall I just start taking them up one by one? Oh, yeah. All right. The first question is from Venugopal. That how would you place intuitiveness in this analytics process? Uh, like I said, intuition uh, is just not enough, right? Intuition coupled with a good business domain knowledge is what strengthens an analytical process, uh, right? So intuition is 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 relevant. Like if you if you look at one of the core competencies that we spoke about is business acumen, right? How do you basically get to a business acumen, right? You you start with intuition. You start with, hey, you know, what do you think is useful for let's say Facebook, 
right? For the video to be, right? For example, let's say um, I am building, I will actually be building uh, this product at um, at LinkedIn, uh, right? Uh, it's called events, right? What? How do you define success for events, right? It starts with intuition, right? And then you marry that entire business domain context. Uh, you learn from it, and then uh, you apply it, right? Uh, definitely, intuition is 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 the first starting point. Thank you for that. Uh, Krishna Kumar has a question that it's pretty interesting that when we do analytics and interpret the data, it's purely based on what data is available. As you previously mentioned that there are other qualitative data which is not accessible to bring in the right interpretation. How should the data scientist manage such a situation and how can he usefully deliver the interpretation? Um, very thoughtful question, right? So I was just talking about this, right? Uh, the example that I gave you, this is a very, very common problem, right? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to give you a terminology that I actually learned from uh, one of my manager, uh, right? At work, his name is Paul King. You should just look him up. Uh, he's actually started his career as software engineer, uh, then uh, did neuroscience, uh, right? Went into kind of like learn cognitive uh, science about how our brain functions. Uh, how do we think and so on and so forth. Uh, did a lot of science, did a lot of physics, uh, a lot of cognitive science. And then, uh, you know, he wanted to kind of like leverage all of that into a business to right? And then, you know, he, he went to Stanford again or Harvard again and then uh, uh, he, he picked up data science and then uh, he's actually working as a data scientist. So, uh, at one of my recent conversations, he said, uh, this is a very common problem. This is not just a problem with data science. This is a problem with every scientist. Right? Imagine, imagine a scientist who is writing a theory about space. Uh, you know, it takes Stephen Hawking's. Right? Can he basically be very precise? No, he doesn't know. Like, like, like in our real life, like data scientists, maybe don't have uh, information, we don't have access to all the information, all the data. Uh, a true scientist of uh, a physics or a neuroscientist or anybody, any scientist out there, uh, they also don't know everything about space. They also don't know everything about you know black hole. Right? But we are still able to make calculated guesses. We're still able to, you know, uh, make uh, some amount of inferences based on directional evidence that we have, right? And he uses this term, which is called precisely being vague, right? Being precisely vague, right? You're not vague, you're not precise, but you're being precisely vague, right? So uh, that's why you would see a lot of like data science people when they say, uh, you know, we, we look at that data and say that it is likely to happen. There is a propensity that he's going to buy. We're not going to, no, no data scientist or an analyst is saying that, you know, this user is going to buy this product, right? His propensity to buy is 70%. His propensity to buy is 80%. Right? There's still a 20% chance that he's not going to buy it, right? So just be very careful with the interpretation and how you kind of communicate because it's important, right? Just, just take this as an example, right? Uh, why do you think we build propensity models? We're not saying we don't have labels like, you know, this person bought and this person is not going to buy, right? If this person is going to buy or not going to buy, right? We, we always communicate or talk uh, in, in a propensity language, right? It being very precisely vague, right? Uh, the 80% probability of propensity is still valuable, right? It still tells me something, right? But you still give that odds of like, hey, there is a 20% chance that this might not be right? But okay, that's okay. That's... Uh, that's something that we can acceptably live with. It's a, it's a reasonable argument, right? Either we don't do anything about it or we take a certain percentage of confidence in it. I hope that answers. Thank you. Uh, Shweta Guru has a question that how important is it for a business person leading a company to understand data scientist skills? Is it better to hire a data scientist or will it be better do that as the data scientist might not, might not have the same business acumen to understand the real ground scenarios. Yeah, let's let's talk about this. Uh, very very relevant questions. I'm actually you know uh, very excited to kind of like see all of these good great questions that are coming up. Right. Uh, let's talk about competencies. I think I am mostly all the answer lies in this competency side. Right. Uh, should we hire a data science person from outside to solve a business problem, or should we make a business problem, a business guy into a data scientist? Is that the question? Right. Good. So uh, you you can hire a data scientist from outside, right? And 
look at what the competency says you really need to have a good understanding of that business right that's why you spend at least a few months once you enter a company you're not worried really truly understanding uh, you know what the business is trying to do or how is the business moving right you spend at least two to three months and you and and uh, i'm pretty sure you must have figured out uh, you know it it takes time right uh, of course i wouldn't know everything like for example um, i'll give you a very very real example okay uh, when i was actually making a, a switch from linkedin to google right um, i had multiple offers right i i was just figuring out you know where should i be right uh, let's take this two example uh, i had uh, an option of picking up crypto a company that is doing cryptocurrencies uh, and let's say another option was it right which one did i understand better right though i understand crypto technology as well i did to be very honest i didn't i knew that i you know you know i'm going to actually have to go through a big learning curve if i join crypto right right of course i had the foundational skills to be a great data scientist right uh, i did really well at linkedin i did really well at wherever i went but you know when when this option came i said i have a good understanding of mobility and compared to crypto right and i prioritized mobility over crypto only because like this gives me an added advantage of uh, knowing this business a little little better than crypto right so knowing that business context is, is very natural you should spend some time reading about it uh doing things so if you make a business person become a data scientist uh right who's going to then run the business right they're never going to do that right but yes a business person could be trained to just understand data right so that it becomes better at just reading data or like interacting with data scientists and so on so but people are always going to hire a specialized data scientist because data scientists actually require some amount of technical skills some amount of statistical skills that are not easy uh for a business person who's Uh, who that is like 35s or 40s to kind of pick up and uh, start doing that right so you know but the only thing to kind of like you know think about is uh, even when you are approaching you know some of these companies out there uh, spend some time learn about that company learn about the business because once you know about their business once you know about what is really happening it's very easy for you to just tackle into this right because you'll be able to bring in that intuition bring in that perspective like for example today uh, most of you should be okay with mobility right because we want travel we all know how mobility works how how transportation works in general right uh, but all of us and if you want to like go to space uh, and do like really you know space related data science it's hard right uh, i really need to spend some time and uh, you know up my learning curve a little bit uh, right before i started to right if tomorrow i want to like get a job at spacex uh, i would spend considerable amount of time just reading about it. right getting that context then move on thank you so much um the next question is from keegan what are the key tips to handle the trade off between interpretability versus accuracy of other ml models or predictive models i think um um into i i i'm a i think people might differ here a little bit but let me let me give you my perspective on this right i'm going to prefer interpretability over accuracy right uh, you know your accuracy might fail tomorrow and you wouldn't even know right today it is accurate based on some some data that you have the world is constantly changing the con- the world is constantly evolving right uh, people are not moving the way that they were moving like when i'm talking about moving people are not you know trying like people are not uh, taking buses cars and you know i'm i'm just going to use moving right so just understand that this is in context to transport right or mobility uh, people are not moving the way that they were moving you know today five years back right i'm pretty sure the next five years is going to be very transformative for mobility as well right the world is changing the world is evolving right rapidly right uh, now what you what you define as accurate today may not be accurate tomorrow but if you don't have that interpretability part tomorrow you would probably be throwing a lot of wrong information out there and you wouldn't even know right so i would always index the interpretability of the question that's right so for so the next question sorry i'm so sorry go 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 all right so for the next question i'm merging three questions because they are on the same lines so anjali vicky and ashima have a question that how do you switch from a co-marketing role into a data analyst role 
or what advice would you have for first timers or beginners into data science which with no prior background awesome uh, it's it's a great question uh, and i really like this question because um, it kind of like uh, reflects my individuality right so um, i did engineering uh, i did telecom engineering or like campus uh, i didn't necessarily have a lot of data science depth or a data science background um, i read right uh, i was very curious to kind of learn what this role is about what this field is all about uh, i spent some time reading uh, then i took up a job uh, as a consultant uh, where i got to slowly work on data a little bit and wanted to try and you know see if uh, if this is very exciting for me right and i, and I absolutely loved it right at that point uh, you know it doesn't matter if you are from marketing if you are from technical non technical background if you right out of college correct uh, if you have the appetite to learn i think you can learn anything right you just need to be disciplined about uh, right you just can't master a skill overnight right it needs patience it needs commitment and it needs discipline right uh, and here uh, there's this famous analogy uh, that one of my uh, colleagues actually uh, told me in one of the one of the interviews when we were reviewing a candidate so it stats uh, somebody did uh, somebody actually did not do well in a stats round right we were, we were going through feedback of the interview candidate uh, and you know the feedback for stats round was really really mixed right some places we felt okay some places we were not okay all right uh, at that point we were like hey does this role really require stats and how hard is stats can a candidate pick up stats Uh, right, he's he's actually a statistician, uh, and he said, "Yeah, I mean, like if a if a guy just read the, the fundamental statistic books like three times, he should pretty much know ninety percent of stats. Right, uh, that's more than enough. All right, so uh, you know, use that as an example. Right, I I always go back to that example. Right, uh, when when there is something new that's catching up. Right, uh, I need to be relevant. So I always go back to that example, saying." Pick up a book, pick up a course, do it a couple of times, you know, you master it, right? Uh, you at least get to know the fundamentals, and then you take a, you know, real life business problem. Uh, you could use platforms like Kaggle, or there are so many, you know, problems, business problems that are out there uh, on the, you know, on the web. Uh, you try and apply that, right? So that you you get that hands-on experience. Uh, data science is not hard. Um, we've had, uh, you know, people who've done BCom uh, become amazing data scientists. Right, uh, people who are statisticians, of course, have become like data scientists. Right, people who are engineering who switched from software to data science. Right, uh, I give you this example of my manager. Uh, right, uh, at one point he he was, he was a software engineer, then did physics, right, neuroscience, and then did data science. Right, so you know anybody could become a data scientist. Right, so if you're moving into a skill-based economy, right. Uh, I don't think so. Your your background, your engineering, your you've done arts, you've done pre-com, you've done uh, I don't even know, right? So there are so many courses out there. Now the matter, like we're really passionate about this. We think like you could be disciplined uh, to spend some time learn this over a couple of times, uh, apply it, and you see, are you enjoying? Are you having fun? Right? If you're actually having fun, just pursue it. Uh, it's it's not hard. You could all become a data scientist, and of course, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a scientist. Right? So there are you know different verticals. Uh, if you're really really passionate about, it, you don't want to talk a lot, uh, then you could do data engineering, uh, right? You could you could actually take up the data engineering flow. Uh, if you uh, don't want to go too technical, uh, right? You could become like a BI analyst, right? So business uh, business intelligence analyst. Uh, if you want to go too technical, then you could basically become like an AI engineer or an ML engineer or a data scientist and so on and so forth. Right? So uh, I've given you that track, right? So if you look at um, you know this. Kind of like summarizes, right? So, see where do you fit in, right? As as an individual, uh, what part of this this journey do you enjoy the most? And index on that. It doesn't necessarily like you should. Uh, so this is something that I say, right? Don't do something that you don't enjoy, right? Because uh, you will start it, but you won't be able to continue it, right? In about two years, you will see that your peers are actually growing much uh, much faster than you would, because you just don't have the appetite. The next question is from Neha. Uh, do you have any key tips for starting of a data science team for a leader within an organization who's building strong cases for insights and strategy? Absolutely. Uh, 
you know we all do that right uh, as a as a data science leader uh, we just don't i mean it's it's not given to us in a basket all right uh, we all have to groom that this team because there are there are a lot of data science teams, right like i told you uh, there's growth in the cloud there's uh, there's variety of verticals that you deal with so the first thing the first and foremost thing is is bring the data in front of people and show that you know how much value are you giving out on the table right uh, just do a very very simple analysis take a business problem all right and show them if you had this data and or if you were to kind of like have some amount of data use that data to actually see if you could actually you know draw an inference of that problem right if yes put it in front of the business right and say that this is how we can solve it. I'll give you an example of uh, what what I did with with one of the uh, marketing teams. All right, so uh, there is this team. Uh, this this didn't happen here. This is a startup. Uh, there was this marketing team that was actually sending push notifications. All right, they have the CRM tool. Uh, they use that tool to send push notifications to you know engage, re-engage the customer. All right. Now uh, uh, what was happening is they were sending push notification. They are not seeing. Their business growing. They're not seeing the users actually engaging on the platform. They're not coming back. Uh, some are coming, some are not coming. We're not seeing like a splurge in our metric, right? We're not seeing like a hot state or or any moment of that. We're like, hey, what's happening, right? So we actually showed them uh, with some of our data that we captured. For every you know thousand push notification that we send in, hundred people are uninstalling them, right? Uh, and your click through rate for that push notification is less than two percent, right? And your industry average is five, right? And the cost of hundred people uninstalling your app is much higher, right? Just suffusing this insight and then adding bringing a layer on top of it, saying that we could build relevant push notification targeting, right? I said if you only targeted these people, you would actually have better conversion. You would not lose users, and you would actually see a lot of value. Right, just demonstrated with data. I mean, like, uh, what better for a data science leader uh, to actually make a case uh, than with data, right? So, take take a business problem somewhere in the company, you know, take that and then use use the data to kind of like you know show value, and that will get you started. Say that, yeah, this is useful, right? Let's run an experiment, and then you know you show value, and then you people will actually come back and do more, would want more from. You. Sorry, uh, thank you for that. With the interest of time, I'll take two more questions. Will that be okay, Mr. Kumar? Sure. Thank you. So, Kisla has a question that how long do we wait for understanding the impact of the data-driven decisions from the point of achieving the desired outcome? That is, when do we say that the analysis is effective or not? Uh, a big question. Uh, right? Uh, there's there's uh, no right answer or wrong answer to this. There are uh, there are just trade-offs, right? Um, there is this construct. I'm, I'm going to give you two or three different examples, right? One is uh, you must have heard this, uh, if not from me, but from like a lot of people saying, uh, "Don't get into analysis paralysis," right? Uh, sometimes you keep digging in deeper, and then you enter a rabbit hole, and you actually don't find things, right? Sometimes you you keep analyzing and then move in a tangent, right? So having a very clear defined problem. Right? You take a problem, you break that problem, uh, right? You take a business problem, construct it into an analytical problem, and you break that analytical problem into smaller chunks, right? And then you start addressing those smaller chunks. That's a that's a good framework that's actually helped me and a lot of other people uh, to avoid entering analysis paralysis, to avoid entering the rabbit hole, right? So that's one. And second, sometimes uh, you know once you have this, uh, it's it's a list of hypotheses, right? So that you're trying to test, all right? Uh, when that happens, uh, you know, you, you list it down all the hypotheses. You, you consult with a business partner. You consult with the product manager. Say, here is all the things that I'm going to test. Um, you know, if if for each of the problem you have three or five hypotheses for each of those broken problem statements, uh, you you get that vetted by by your product manager, your designer, your engineer. Get them to add your inputs. They are going to say, yeah, this five hypothesis makes sense, or they might actually come back and say, can you add two more? Correct. Right? And just solve that, right? And say that, hey, we've tested for seven. Uh, all of them are invalid, right? I think we should stop here, right? And then move on to the next thing, right? So that one. Second uh, is velocity, 
right? There's always this question about velocity when you when you actually get into the analytics field or data science, right? Uh, you know, what is a compromise of you know speed versus quality, right? You're always going to be questioned on this. Uh, there's no right or wrong answers. Uh, as as data people, we should know when to go deeper and when not to. Right? How critical the business problem is, or how critical the business problem not is, right? If the business problem actually has a lot of sensitivity, you know that you really need precision, all right? Uh, then go deeper, right? If you know that, hey, you know, it's, it's only about like you know figuring out propensity to buy a product. Uh, there is no harm. Uh, the cost of sending an email is pretty low. It's okay, right? So then you then optimize for speed, uh, right, or velocity, uh, over quality. Um, the last question is from Ashutosh Rao. That there is a clear demarcation between the skill set and responsibilities of a data engineer working on ETL and pipelines, and an ML engineer or data scientist using the data. But a lot of times, even on LinkedIn, the job descriptions for ETL roles are pretty big, and machine learning engineers end up being asked to do ETL roles. Are, are the non FAANG firms now moving towards the cle towards clearly demarking the roles? Um, great question, uh, right? Uh, I keep getting this question a lot, right? Uh, I wouldn't blame the companies for doing so, right? Sometimes they're hiring for a lot of roles, uh, one. Uh, and sometimes some of this, uh, you know, relatively newer companies which are entering the data domain uh, don't also have a lot of clarity, right? Uh, you know, sometimes the company or the hiring manager, they're in a rush, uh, they copy paste a lot of stuff. So I wouldn't take the JD at face value, all right? Here is my two cents or two pieces of advice, right? It doesn't hurt you, right? This is how you should prioritize this, right? Look at a job function. If you think like, hey, 50 to 60% of that job role makes sense with you, just apply it, right? The first round of the conversation, the first interview loop is going to be an exploratory conversation. During that time, you are basically going to clarify, just clarify this question during that time, right? The person is basically going to provide you a very clear picture of what is expected of you, right? Um, you know, I would I would generally say, keep this as like your two cent framework. Um, you know, look at the description, don't read too much into it, don't, you know, don't read too much into it line by line. Let's say 50% of it makes sense, apply for it. Take a first round, the first round is going to be 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, just talk to the interviewer. In most cases, you're talking to somebody who's going to do telephone interview, phone call, or a recruiter right, in the beginning. Just clarify, right? Ask them this question, right? And second, uh, is uh, an ML engineer in some companies uh, is also supposed to do ETLs. It's, 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 it's natural, right? Uh, it's, um, how do I say it? For example, uh, you know, building pipelines, right? Some companies have this role ML ops predefined, some companies don't, right? It requires an ML engineer to do both, right? Ask that question up front, right? Do you, like, how is my day going to look like, right? When I'm building a model, what what are the different components that you want me to work on, right? There are different teams and different places that are addressing this differently. So there is no right or wrong answer. I won't be able to precisely answer uh, this question. But the best answer that you can get is like, you know, clarify this during, during the interview uh, to get a very good understanding of what that company is all about. Right. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Mr. Kumar, for taking out time for us. I think we have gained a lot of information and a lot of insights into the wonderful world of data science. And I think this is definitely going to help our learners and giving us food for thought on how to build or progress their careers in data science and analytics or use it to progress. So once again, on the behalf of all the learners and emeritus and eruditus, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for you being here with us today and for taking out the time. Thank you so much and I wish everyone an amazing day and a happy weekend ahead. Thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure uh, being here. Thank you, Minakshi, for the kind words. Uh, have a great day. Have a, have a good weekend. Thank you.